machine, it's being pulled at a constant rate. So it just says the material plastically deforms and unloads the machine, and then the machine has to catch up with it and loads it back up to the ultimate strength. <coughs> now the reason that the curve bends over at the end is because it necks. We, we have a lot of interesting things in metals. It looks like that they may be uh, animals instead of mineral type things because, I mean, they do a lot of necking and that we even have twins in material that we talk about. So they don't, and we reproduce grains in the material. And so, but it's all inanimate, of course. But what really happens is if we have a tensile specimen, as the ones we just looked at in the last two uh, slides, we put it in a testing machine, we pull it, and when we get to the ultimate strength, somewhere in the specimen, and not necessarily in the midpoint, but we always hope it to be in the midpoint, somewhere in the specimen, there will be a, a localized stress that is higher than the stress everywhere else around it. And so the specimen at that particular point will begin to yield or to flow faster than the rest of the material. Because we're really having flow to occur now, plastic flow. When, you, when that lady bent that material, she was causing it to plastically flow. That, that was what was happening. And so it plastically flows in just one region and that means the material keeps getting smaller and smaller in that region and it's called the necked region. It just makes a little neck. And uh, the cross-sectional area, of course, is less. And so the load required now to pull the specimen is less than if it were applied to the cross-sectional area of the big piece. Just like the exercise that, let's say, the old timers were trying, a big piece versus a little piece. Now within one specimen we have a little piece and a big piece and so the little piece flows with a lower load on it or it has a, a, a representative lower stress because we are basing all of this on the original cross-sectional area. Metallurgists just don't like that and so they use something called a true stress, true, stay, true strain diagram but I'm not going to uh, bother you with that today. Stress is determined by dividing the load on the specimen by the specimen's cross-sectional area. Strain is elongation of the specimen divided by the specimen's original length. Modulus of elasticity, or Young's modulus, equals stress divided by strain in the elastic deformation region of the stress-strain curve. Modulus of resilience is the area under the modulus of elasticity curve assuming the elastic limit is known. Plastic deformation generally makes metals and alloys stronger. We have looked now at, uh, at what we can get for a material. Uh, a piece of steel, a piece of copper, we have got these characteristic pictures that we can develop. But how do they compare? That is, if we're interested in looking at one metal versus another. Now, obviously, uh, the kind of plot that we have in this particular slide, which is an indication of the elastic portion of the stress-strain curves for iron, copper, and aluminum. And those particular curves, this being for iron, says it has a modulus of elasticity that is higher than copper. This being copper, which has one higher than aluminum. That being the aluminum. So obviously, you ought to be able to find in textbooks, in reference books somewhere, these kinds of curves for every alloy that we find useful to us. But it's going to be a lot easier to put the values in the handbooks rather than put all these curves. And so we do. We just call it Young's modulus, and we measure the slope of that curve, and that's what's reported as Big E. One of the things that is interesting about this particular part of the curve that Jung showed us years ago was if we're interested in the velocity of a sound wave in the material, all we really have to know is what the slope of that line is. And when we do our 15th lecture here, we're going to be talking about uh, things like NDT and NDE, non-destructive testing, non-destructive evaluation, and we find out that that becomes all important to us. We need to know how fast an elastic wave will run in the material. And during the course of the, of the course here, and the courses here now, I'm going to be talking about that speed of sound in another way. But Young pointed out to us that if we want to know the speed of sound in the metal, it's equal to the square root of Young's modulus over the mass density of the material. So if we can measure Young's modulus and we measure the density 
and divide it by the gravitational constant and take the square root of it, we know how fast the sound will move into metal. And it's generally something like 18,000 feet per second for steel or something like that. Whereas it's only 1,000 feet per second or something like that in air. <coughs> well, is that all we need to know to do the design work? The answer is no. <coughs> because the yield strength, the yield point of the material is oft times very, very difficult to measure. In, a, in this next slide that we're going to look at, we'll find out that here's a device that the design engineer uses because we do not know the exact elastic limit of the material. <coughs> we do not know where the material yields plastically. If, if this were our stress-strain curve, and we went up this curve elastically, the elastic limit may be somewhere in here, somewhere beyond this proportional limit. We don't know where it is, and it takes too much time for every material to load it up, unload it, load it up, unload it. And so what we do is, we know that when we get into the plastic region up here somewhere, if we unload the material, it will unload with a modulus that is exactly the same as the loading modulus. So the slope of this line is also Young's modulus. And so now, if we take the, the curve, or draw the slope, excuse me, draw the elastic modulus parallel to the loading modulus. We haven't unloaded this. We're just interested in that intersection point. If we took this value, let's say, at, at 2 tenths percent offset, 2 tenths percent strain offset, we could specify a yield strength at 1 tenth percent offset. That would be up to whoever wants to do the designing. But that particular value where it intersects is called the yield strength. Now when you get to this point, you, you can bamboozle anybody you want. Because you can say, if they ask you, what's the strength of the piece of aluminum? You can respond. Do you mean the elastic limit, the proportional limit, the yield strength, the ultimate strength, or the rupture strength? Or were you really referring to the energy required to deform the material like the modulus of resilience or the modulus of toughness, which is the area under the total curve. So you see, that, that little curve that we got that looks so simple is telling us one heck of a lot of information. But gee whiz, is that a constant curve? The answer is, no, it's not a constant curve. We talked about that before. If I change the temperature, that curve changes. If I change the velocity at which I do the test, that curve can change. So we're gonna have to specify what it's like. We have to specify what the grain size is. And if it's a material that can be heat treated, what's the heat treatment of the material? We cannot just say that a piece of aluminum has a stress strain curve that looks like this. We've got to use a lot more words to describe it. <coughs> well, we have uh, other ways to, to talk about the material characterization. And one of the ways we do this is by hardness. Now, when we, when we look at hardness, a hardness evaluation, like if, if I looked at this chart that I have in front of me that tells me a lot of different ways to measure hardness, I find out that right up front, I got a problem. Again, it's this semantics problem. What do you mean when you say something is hard? If I ask you, what does the word hard mean? I know the response I'm going to get back from you is, it means difficult, right? Then I ask you, what's the difference between something being hard and something being tough? Does tough also mean difficult? Well, wh what is the real difference? How would you measure something that is hard? Well, the first people that did this were the mineralogists, the people who were interested in rocks and minerals, <coughs> and they evaluated, evaluated the min minerals many times by scratching one on the other. And they developed something that was called a Mohs scale of hardness. M-O-H-S, Mohs scale of hardness. Where they take, let's say, a rock. Maybe it's a piece of talc and a piece of quartz. They try to scratch the quartz with the talc, and they find out they couldn't do it. But the quartz would scratch the talc. That says the quartz is harder than the talc. And they took all the minerals that they could get, and they put them in a, a series, and they found out the hardest thing on the face of the earth is diamond. Nothing will scratch diamond ex except a piece of diamond. <coughs> and so, on the most scale of hardness, then we have a perfectly good index. Can I take a piece of copper and tell you whether it's harder than a piece of aluminum this way? Oh yeah, I, I could. However, we find that we have uh, lots of problems because it doesn't really tell us what we need to know. 
What we would really like to do is to be able to run some sort of a hardness test, some simplistic test that will illustrate for me what that stress-strain curve is supposed to look like. And so we have a whole array of, uh, of hardnesses that we use. <coughs> and these hardnesses uh, are the Brunel hardness number, the Rockwell hardness number, the Vickers hardness number, the Noop number. And we have an indenter that's used in them. And let's talk about the Brunel at first. What we really use here is a hardened steel or tungsten carbide ball. It's 10 millimeters in diameter. It's spherical in shape. We load it over top of a specimen. That if it's a piece of steel with 3,000 kilogram load, and it makes a dent in the specimen. And then we remove it and we measure the diameter of the impression. And we can relate that to the ultimate tensile strength if it's steel. If it is a piece of brass, a bronze, a non-ferrous material, we can run a Brunel test, but now we would Instead of loading it with 3,000 kilogram load, we load it with a 500 kilogram load, and we can find a hardness, a relative number. It's just a relative number, but we could not necessarily equate that to the ultimate strength of the brass or bronzes. That table was just worked out for steel. <coughs> In the Rockwell hardness test, we also use penetrators of two types. <coughs> In one type, we use a cone. Uh, a diamond cone, it's called a Rockwell C hardness number. And in this particular case, we have a 120 degree cone, diamond cone, we push it in the material, but we directly measure the degree of penetration and we get a relative number so we can compare one material with another material. <coughs> we also use an indenter that's hardened steel sphere, a 16th of an inch in diameter or varying in size, depending on what we want to measure. And we do an impression and again, we get the depth of the impression, so it is a direct reading device. The Vickers device is uh, very similar to that. Uh, we have a penetrator, and the penetrator in this particular case is a, a pyramid, and the pyramid is pushed in the material and leaves a, a structure that's almost square, and we can measure the diagonals of this and get a hardness, relative hardness number. The noop is almost exactly the same, except the diamond in this case is uh, engraved or carved to look like a ROM, and we get a ROM-based uh, pyramid impression that we can measure and, again, get the hardness. Now, we do this on a macroscopic scale. Macroscopic meaning that I, I measure many, many crystals at one time in the Brunel hardness test. If the grain size is real big, if the crystal size is real big, as it would be in the board that I showed you this morning, and we put a Brunel impression on this, the crystal is bigger than the Brunel ball, so I'm going to be testing a single crystal, one single crystal. So many times since the microstructure controls what that stress-strain curve is going to look like or what other properties are going to look like, I want to know not only what the hardness is macroscopically, I want to go inside the material and look at all of the different crystals, if you please, or the different phases that are inside to find out what their hardness will be. And so, in the next slide, we see that we have <coughs> a picture of what a diamond impression would look like <coughs> if we did this on a, on a certain phase that's in the material. Now, this is a piece of steel, and what we really have here is <coughs> we have uh, a second phase, which is this white material that you will see, and in it you will see that ROM impression that's there. Now, that ROM impression is a new impressor that's been made in it and we can measure the length of the that impressor that gives us it isn't as long as the impression that's over here in the darker material which is in the body of the steel so it says that this material right here is softer than that material that is it'll the penetrator will go in deeper right and so since it go in deeper we know it's softer and we can